All right, everyone, it is six o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Central, and we're very excited to welcome you all to tonight's presentation. I'm Matthew Ross. I'm one of the national board members with Wild Ones. On behalf of Executive Director Jen Ainsworth, the Wild Ones staff and Nina Wisconsin, our honorary directors and the Wild Ones National Board, we're excited to welcome you to tonight's webinar. This presentation will be recorded for you to review and to share with your members, prospective members, and friends. You'll notice that your camera and microphone have been turned off. And if you have any questions for tonight's presenters, we ask and encourage you to use the question and answer tab that's at the bottom of your screen if you're using a desktop or that might be on the right panel if you're using a mobile device or tablet. Today, we're celebrating the hard work and dedication of the wild ones. As a national board, we were looking for a way to progress the native plant movement and provide tangible and actionable plans for the chapters, our membership, and the general public. We sought out grant assistance for this incredible undertaking. While there currently are seven designs that have been completed for Chattanooga, Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Tallahassee, and Toledo, we're continuing the work that was started by these incredible designers. We're now working on a design for the Boston Basin as we speak and are in talks to continue to build more native plant garden designs. These templates were created with the premise that using native plants in the landscape can be beautiful, promote wildlife, and be achievable for gardeners of all skill sets in terms of scope and budget. A committee of dedicated board members spent well over a year and countless hours enacting this ambitious vision. We'd like to thank Pam Todd, Susan Hall, Denise Gehring, Janice Hand and Marty Agler that were masterful in achieving this grant, Sally Wenzel, our current board president, Elaine, and also Katie for promoting the direction and our current executive director, Jen Ainsworth and the board for this incredible launch. The traction that we're getting right now on our social posts and through the development of this program is unheralded. It's fantastic. It's a great way to encourage others to see the benefits of Wild Ones. We're gonna to talk tonight about two of the designs with two of our designers, but we hope that you join us as this series will continue on and move forward with an opportunity to meet the other designers. Each design includes at least 15 or more native plant species. It uses multiple plants rather than specimen plantings to be consistent with building attractive pollinator gardens according to the recommendations of the Xerxes Society and other science-based pollinator advocates. It favors species with long and staggered bloom times to enhance the ornamental nature of the gardens and provide pollen and nectar throughout the season. It includes considerations concerning soil type, as well as conditions for sunlight, moisture that are typical for the specific ecoregion. Each design includes an incremental approach to developing the plan, adding new areas and native plant species as time and funds permit. Today, we're gonna to hear a brief presentation from each of your designers. First, it will be Susan Hall and then Danielle Bell. I'll introduce both of them right now, and then I will pass the baton over to Susan Hall, who will share our first presentation. Susan Hall is, a passion, is passionate about using native plants in the home landscapes. As a landscape designer and certified horticulturalist, she feels it's important to educate homeowners on the many benefits of native plants in their home landscape. She grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and was introduced to native plants by members of the Oak Openings. And I know there's many other Oak Openings chapter members in the audience tonight. A move 10 years ago that took her to Berkeley County, West Virginia, where she designed both residential and commercial spaces. She currently lives in Corpus Christi, Texas, near her parents. Her focus now, in addition to her design work, is creating a landscape design program for Del Mar Community College Continuing Education Program. The most popular class to date is Xeriscape Management, which focuses entirely on native plants. Examples of Susan's work can be found on her YouTube channel, Hidden in a Garden Design. Additionally, working on the Toledo project was Denise Gehring, whose Knowledge is unparalleled. She loves uh, to share it and was instrumental in bringing this design to life. She's been a mentor to myself, 
a, a former board member and board president and was instrumental in making this happen. Growing up in rural Wisconsin, Danielle Bell explored the natural world, starting in the oak hickory woodland of her parents' home. While working in the green industry and on restoration projects, she noticed the disconnect humans have with our landscapes, large scale projects, and not with home, well, oh, sorry, with our landscapes, especially in the urban environment. The restoration projects that she managed focused on large scale projects and not with homeowners with a small urban property. Seeing this need, she began Native Roots LLC to help own homeowners incorporate native plants into their landscapes. She uses her experience from restoring native wetlands, prairies, and woodlands throughout southeastern Wisconsin to inspire her residential designs. Her passion is to restore sterile turf grass monocultures into healthy, sustainable, diverse habitats that both people and wildlife can enjoy. As part of helping homeowners create healthy, functional landscapes, she educates them on how to sustainably manage their property through invasive species monitoring and plant identification. As mentioned earlier, and I can already see because Ruth and Christy and Jan have already started asking questions, they will be fielding questions at the end of their presentations. I'm gonna invite Susan Hall to turn on her video and also share her screen as she presents the first part of tonight's presentation. Welcome, Susan, we're excited to have you here with us. Hey, thanks, Matt. Okay, everybody, let me get my screen all shared and we will be good to go. All right. And waiting for that to go up. Okay, so it's good to meet everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Um, designing with native plants is like one of my favorite things to do. So I'm gonna go through the process. If you've never designed a garden, you wanna you know, have a bit of a better, a better wrapping ability to wrap your head around how to do this, we're gonna go through some basics. The first thing I need um, you guys to do is know what you like. Um, visit gardens, look at garden design websites. Um, you know, Pinterest is most people's best friend right now. So look at that. Um, create a list of what you want to see in your landscape. So maybe you see a design that has this beautiful front entryway. You save that. And then when you go to design your own garden, you don't have to do as much work because you know, I like how this looks. And I just want to replace the plants that they use that aren't native with native plants. And that's what I um, I find people get overwhelmed by garden design because it's not what you guys do every day. That's cool. You don't have to be able to do it every day, but you can figure out what you like and we're gonna make a cohesive plan. And the first step is figuring out what you wanna have in your garden. Okay, so we're gonna go the right way. Okay, so what are your goals when you guys do a design? For me as a designer, my goals are to create something that's beautiful. I don't want people to feel like they have a messy yard. Um, I, I know I hear a lot of that from clients that are really concerned about, well, if I do natives, it's not gonna look pretty. And I'm like, it absolutely will look pretty. You can have a lawn garden area that looks beautiful and still be natives. So get, get on that bandwagon. Um, I wanna restore habitat. Um, because we are so fragmented. That is my goal. You can decide what your goals are, but I'm hoping yours are kind of similar to mine today. Um, and then also to retain water on site. We don't want water to run off our properties. We want to keep as much as much of it on site as we can. Um, and my goal as a designer is I don't use pesticides and I try to encourage limiting the use of pesticides so that that way we have healthier environments. Um, and then to build healthy soils. Um, because our garden is going to be so much better with the healthier soil. And I am always about putting down mulch and incorporating compost if you are having deficient soils. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, so we're going to go on to my next slide. And the first thing I do whenever I go to a garden or a property is a site analysis. And um, it's really important that you as a homeowner analyze your site and what, what things you have on it. And I put up my list of things that I try to look at. Um, I look at you know where all your utilities are. I look at gas. Um, I look at the mailbox. I look at street lights. I look at um, entryways. I look at existing plant material on site. A lot of people get overwhelmed when they go to create a garden design and they're like, um, I've got all these existing plants. Well that's okay, we can keep those and we can add to it. 
or we can remove things and put in new. You don't have to completely um, tear everything out and start over. Um, so go ahead and look at what you have on site. And some of what you have on your property might be native. You might have oak trees. That's great. It's a great plant to have. It is a host for so many different insects. So just look at what you have and then look at what your problem areas are. So I'll look at, as you go into a house, I'm gonna go to the next slide here. I'll go in, this is not really, this is not my house, but it's just a house I found online. <laughs> it's open source. But if we looked at this property and as a designer, what, what are we gonna do? We're gonna go in and look and we're gonna see that there's a lot of huge foundation plantings. Um, we're gonna see that there's not a lot of color. There's not a lot of visual interest. The backyard is just, pavers. It's got some great places that you can plant things. And so you want to go through your home garden and analyze what's going on. Maybe there's a place down there at the bottom of this planting box where water stands. Well, we can figure out ways to mitigate that and to build into our design things that will help that area not have standing water anymore. So just look at your, your home as an opportunity to um, make changes and if I were this homeowner, if I were the designer for this homeowner, I would absolutely go in and take out all the foundation shrubs and do, do a do-over. But maybe this person isn't comfortable with that. So maybe we leave their foundation shrubs and we start adding in natives in between, or we take out a couple and add in natives in between. So that's something you need to think about. You don't have to start with a clean slate right now. You can go ahead and, and work from where you are. All right. So the next step that I do is I actually kind of draw out my plan. And this is our basic garden design for this, for this um, hypothetical property that we have. And I went ahead and I decided on things that I wanted to have happen. So I noted everywhere that I, I, I expected people to walk. So you can see all the pink arrows that shows the different um, traffic areas. And I noted that some of it, you know, around the one side, I'm going to have a mower go through. Well, that's going to change how I do a design there. If I have the back patio, I note where people walk out in the back patio. Um, and then I had that whole fence line and I'm like, well, if I were there, I would want privacy. So I sketched in that I want trees and shrubs and privacy. Um, so go through your home property, go ahead and make a list of all the things you see on your site and what you want to do. In this hypothetical garden in the front yard, we had a an area where water stood. And so we put a rain garden in there. Um, we have an existing tree on site. So we're gonna put a shade garden under that. And these are the things that you can look at and just do a sketch like this. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be perfect, but go ahead and note, hey, I've got shade over here. So on this shady side of the house, that's gonna be a shade garden. I have a tree right here. What am I gonna put under the tree? I need to put things there that can handle the lack of light. The front, entrance, I really want to wow people and I really want to invite people into my yard or I want to invite people to look at my yard. You may not want them in your yard, but that's all right. So I did a dry riverbed there and then a water fountain to um, just mitigate some of the sound and noise you have coming off the street. So just look at different things around the house. I knew I wanted to have foundation planting. So I noted those and I put my little green lines and that's how I start a design. I look at my different areas and what I want to use them for. So we've got on this garden, we have um, a work area in the backyard because that's where we knew we wanted, we wanted to have a vegetable garden. So we put that in a, in a good spot there that we get sun. Um, and then Denise Daring is so wonderful and she was my partner in crime on this. And so she um, was like, don't forget the compost area. So we put in a compost area and we kind of concealed it with the plant material that we put around it. Um, she also wanted a bird watching area and I'm like, yeah. And then she was really awesome. And she's like, well, we're going to do something a little different. I want to put the bird watching area in the middle of my patio. And I'm like, okay. So I found a way to do that for her. And so you need to go through and just brainstorm what you want to achieve. And then you do this little drawing and it'll help you think through the process. So I'm going to go through the next slide and Okay, so the next step in a garden design, when I get that big piece of paper out and I'm looking at it, I try to create focal points. Um, in this instance, I created a focal point by the fire pit being over in the corner. I knew I wanted to provide privacy and that was on my drawing. 
But then I was like, why not take advantage of that privacy? I need another entertaining area. So I'm going to put the fire pit over there. And so that gives your eye somewhere to go. They come out the back door and they're not focused on that patio or that table. They're looking across the yard. The other side of the yard, of course, has the meadows. They're gonna look at that on one side. And then on the, um, as you come down the steps, you see this little area where we put the um, bird feeders. And what we did was we used um, paving stones that you could move around so that if you needed to, um, clean up underneath them, it was a little bit better. And if you got tired of your bird feeder being in one spot, you could move it. That was Denise's idea. So it was very fun. All right, so let's go to the next. So make sure you give yourself something to look at. Along the front walkway, we did the um, dry riverbed and water feature. It's always good to have a view. Okay, so once you figured out um, what you basically want in different places, you got your basic structure, you know where you want privacy, you've created some views, you've decided on what you wanna to use to focus the eye across the yard. We need to look at right plant, right place. And um, I think this is the thing that people have the hardest time with is they try to fit something in where it doesn't go. So the um, key to this is knowing what your available light is. Is it full sun? Is it shade? Is it semi-shade? What do you have going on? Then you need to know your soil type. And a soil test is great. Um, you can contact your extension office and get a soil test done. It makes a world of difference in knowing what, what kind of ground materials you have to work with. When I lived in Toledo, I actually had a sandy loam all the way and it was mostly swampy in the backyard. Um, but my dad lived on the other side of town and he had all clay. So you have to look at really what soil you have in your yard and you need to get it tested. That helps a lot. If you don't get it tested, at least know whether you have sand, whether you have clay, whether you have loam, whatever you have. Um, and then you need to know your water availability. So for instance, in my backyard, I had a lot of standing water in the spring and I knew I had a high, a high water content back there, but in my front up along my house, it was all dry sand. So know if you've got standing water somewhere, know if it's dry, know if it, just know what happens in your yard. And then as you look at your plants, you're gonna wanna find plants that fit that light, that fit that soil and that fit that water level. Um, and you can find all that information online. If you um, want a good native plant website to look at, the um, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center has really good things up for all the different native plants. There are other websites, but that's the one that I'm, I'm frequently used. And I used it before I lived in Texas. So just so you know, that's the one I use for a lot of the data that I get. Um, then the other thing you need to take a look at is the mature height of a plant, um, because a lot of times we buy these little four inch pots and we think that we need to put this little four inch pot and then put like 10 of them in a space. But maybe this little four inch pot actually ends up being a three by five plant. Um, you know, like Joe Pieweed gets really big, gets tall. You, you need to know how big it gets when it's mature and don't overplant. Um, that's like super important. And um, let's go to our next slide. All right. So in this instance, I got a couple of my plant lists up here and it shows rain garden moist soils. I have semi-shade and woodland over on the other side. So what I would do is I would come up with a plant palette. Now in this instance, I had what I thought were good plants and then Denise was like, no, 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 you've got better things. So you wanna find um, someone who's an expert on that area and you can determine exactly what plants will do well in each situation. And I would recommend getting a hold of your wild ones group because they will have a lot of people who know the plants there. Um, here in Texas, we don't have wild ones but we have an amazing native plant society here and they have a lot of experts. So you would want to go ahead, and I do this with my with my clients, where I'll make them a sheet like this, and it'll have shade plants, it'll have full sun plants. So if I go as a designer and I'm going in, I'm like, I know that these plants are tough as nails, and that they will work in whatever area you know the area that we've got figured out for them. So if I need a shade plant, I'll be like, here are some shade plants we can start with. If they want something different, I can always find something different. But go ahead and make yourself a list of things that you like, and start at that point. Okay, so I showed you my little plant list. And then what we wanna do is we wanna simplify. When I do a design, um, I'll probably have, I don't know, 10, 10 species per area. But when you start 
maybe you want to start with three to five. And the reason you want to do that is because it, it's a lot simpler to wrap your head around making mass plantings and doing bands of plants when you've got three to five. And um, then what you want to do as you design is choose those three to five plants and then plant them in groupings. And the minimum I use is three, unless we're talking a tree or a shrub. The minimum I use is three of something, and I usually go five to seven of each to create wide groupings of the plants so that you can see them as you go. If you look in the background on, over here on the left, I've got the grasses and I put them in groups and those are all in groups of three, just so you can really see their presence instead of seeing just one there. And then you might, it just doesn't give as much visual impact. All right, so. You wanna vary your texture. So I, this is a lot like when you do a container planting where you have a thriller, a spiller and a filler. I do the same thing in my garden designs. I make sure I have something tall to draw attention. Um, a lovely actress, Blazing Star, it'll really draw your attention because it's got those nice vertical, vertical heights. And then you choose things that spill over the edge. Um, in this instance, in the front of the bed, I've got Coreopsis. And then you choose things to fill in in the middle whether that be mountain mint, anything like that, but you just vary your textures and it will give you a lot more visual interest. So also when you're looking at your species, if you're gonna do three to five different species, choose species that stagger bloom time. Um, you could have you know, winter interest here. We've got the ilex, the um, holly, it gives winter interest. So the leaves will drop, but you'll still have berries. We've got the beauty berry, which has great berries in the fall and persists a little bit into winter. Um, nodding onion in the spring, that's one of Denise's favorites. So I made sure to put that there. And then the aster gives you great fall color. So you don't want everything to bloom in the summer and then to be done. You wanna have visual interest throughout the entire year. Okay, so then you can go ahead and create your design. And what I would do is not go crazy and try to do, you know, it doesn't have to be professional, but you can at least decide on what you want in different areas and start with your plants. And then just start to work in and figure out which area you wanna focus on first. So as I um, help people come up with designs, a lot of times you'll do designs where you have to do them in phases because it's just cost prohibitive to do the whole thing at once. So I'll sit down with a client and we determine available money and time. Well, if you're doing this at home, figure out your available money and figure out your available time to install this. And you don't wanna bite off more than you can handle. You wanna work it as simply as you can so that you aren't overwhelmed and so you actually enjoy your garden and enjoy installing it. The other key on that budget and time situation is purchasing smaller plants, you know, plugs or four inch containers that you can let them grow into the space. And it might take until next year for you to see a really good return on your investment, but get them in, get the roots started and let them grow. And then next year, you know, you'll have good show this year, but next year it'll be amazing. The second year is always the best. Um, when you look at how we, how I phased in this design, I phased in phase one, I did foundation plantings because that's, you know, the key on the house. Um, I did the rain garden because that was up in the front of the house. So I focused on the in front of the house and foundation plantings around it. Um, when you look to do a second phase in phase two in this, in this yard, I installed the fence line privacy and I did the vegetable garden behind the house. And then I did the fire pit seating area. And then for phase three, we planned in the side shade garden and then this bird viewing area with the additional plantings that would go there. So just break your, break your phases up. You can have seven phases. It doesn't matter. However many you wanna have, just go ahead and plan your phases and then take it as fast or as slow as you want. Um, I will give you my two, my two big tips for gardens to look nice when you do the installation. And one of them is to have clean cut bed edges. Um, please cut your bed edges nice and clean. Don't, you don't have to put in stone and then have people tripping over it and have it be poorly installed. You can just do a nice simple bed edge. You don't have to invest in edging. You can just cut it every year with an edger and then mulch. And you can see the difference in a bed that is clean versus not clean. So this is, these are just my couple tips on that. And then last but not least, please mulch. And you wanna make sure that you install three to four inches of mulch because it retains moisture and it reduces your weeds. And then whenever you install mulch, I put a little planting, um, a planting insert there. You wanna keep the mulch off the root of the shrub or the perennial, so the base of it so that it doesn't rot. And then 
that like will make a huge difference in how your garden looks. Just mulching that first couple of years and cut veg edges and it'll look 10 times better. Okay, that's what I've got. Thank you very much, Susan. Yep. And thank you all for your questions. We're, we're fielding those at the end. So we wanna keep that going and keep the momentum going. So Danielle, if you'd like to uh, turn on your camera and share your screen, we're gonna have Danielle continue our presentation right now. Thanks, Matt. Um, welcome, everyone. I am glad to be a part of this program and really honored to be um, involved in the Wild Ones and involved here um, and be a part of this, this grant that they were rewarded. So I am in Milwaukee, in Wisconsin, and I will go through how I approach clients um, that reach out to me to bring natives into their landscape. The first question I usually ask them or just looking at their property, how I want to approach the design is, you know, how are we, what is the existing conditions? You know, are we doing a landscape design in an urban property where, you know, we're not gonna be able to revert um, the landscape back to what it was historically. For example, Milwaukee used to be a flooded wetland. We're never gonna get back to that just because we have manipulated the landscape so much uh, that we need to think a different way uh, to bring natives into the landscape. And, but it's still important to put natives into these landscapes because it provides stopover habitat, especially in Milwaukee, you know, we're along Lake Michigan. It's a huge flyway zone for migrating birds. If you've been outside at all, um, you've probably already heard the red winged blackbirds are back. Some of the robins are moving back. You know, we're, we're in that time of year right now and they need somewhere to go. They need somewhere to rest and, um, get back their energy res reserves that they've depleted over the past couple months. Um, and so with urban design too, we can also incorporate different ecosystems into one uh, property because we have different microclimates that are going on. Um, so we can actually get more different species in into one property than say if we're doing a large restoration project. Um, where, for example, in a suburban development, you know, we have maybe it used to be a farm field, so we can do a prairie area. Uh, we want to connect to any wildlife um, refugees or state natural areas that might be next to it. You know, we want to look at what is existing in those properties and see how we can either add more species to that diversity or include those species and kind of blur that edge. Um, because plants and animals, they don't, they don't see boundaries like humans do. So we want to, you know, bring that natural area that might be adjacent or on your property and bring it into your landscape design. And with both of these types of designs, though, we want to increase the biodiversity. And by doing that, we're uh, creating uh, resilient landscapes that actually will thrive and survive better. So I mentioned microclimates. This is something that you want to do when you look at your landscape, your property. You'll want to kind of go through, usually I tell people if you can wait, <laughs> wait a year or so um, to actually walk your property during different times of the day, during different times of the year. The landscape is always changing. Um, and so you want to make notes, just like Susan was saying, you know, kind of looking at, you know, how is the sunlight being affected by man-made structures, such as your house, um, your, you know, the driveway, the sidewalks, um, those are all manipulating the landscape, as well as the natural landscape that's there. You might have a shade tree that's already present on your property, and even the different species of trees. So if it's a honey locust tree that has really fine leaf texture, so you have more sunlight underneath versus a Norway maple, where you can get, hardly get any sun to shine through that dense canopy. So making notes like that will help you decide um, what plants you can select for those areas. And um, looking at downspouts, that's an op opportunity to harvest rainwater and keep it on your site and that will give you a different plant community. So for the, the theoretical design that we did, I looked at how the conditions that we have in Milwaukee. So normally we have a shade tree in front that's most likely a Norway maple. You have a wet area in the corner of the property um, that's either drainage from your own property or from your neighbors. And um, then you might have a couple other areas that are sunny, wide open, and that provides us for a prairie habitat. 
Um, and you also want to think about how you want to use the landscape too. And Susan kind of mentioned that during her um, her description of the land of this design. And so you want to think, you know, do you have kids? Do you plan to have kids? Do you have pets? Um, do you want to entertain a lot outside? You know, how do you want to use your landscape? Because as much as I would like everybody to plant their landscape for wildlife only, we also are living in that landscape too and are part of it. So we want to enjoy it and be out there and see what's going on. So once you have all of those microclimates listed out, then going into the plant selection, you can look at what species would actually work there. And in Wisconsin, we are blessed with a wide range of different plant communities that call um, the Midwest home. Uh, we have met meadows, we have dry prairies, we have ponds and wetlands, and we also have woodlands and savannas. So in Wisconsin, there's not really an excuse for not having a native plant on your property because there's so many to choose from and you can get so many different varieties into one um, property. So yeah, these, the plant selection of the communities is going to be based on your microclimates. And once you have that narrowed down, then you can start looking at individual species that are um, going to work on your property. And when you have these plant communities and that gives you a list to choose from, and then you can look at the ones and say, hey, I really like this species. I really like, um, you know, bloodroot for a woodland plant. I really like columbine for a woodland plant. You know, then you can start to see which ones you want to put into your landscape. And we know they're all going to work together because we find them in nature together. So you don't have to worry about, is this one going to overcompete this plant um, as much? Um, because they're thriving together in nature already. And when you have these different ecosystems uh, on one property in an urban landscape, then you start to have these transition zones. So for going from a woodland planting to a prairie planting or from a woodland into a, a wet uh, wetland area, the wet part of your property, those transition zones are where you get to see a lot of activity going on. And that's you know, where we see a lot of that habitat and those, those hedge species as well, putting those in there. Um, and you start to, start to see the blending of um, each environment, each ecosystem, and it gives it more of a continuity versus having to find hard edges. Um, when I'm doing native landscaping plans, that's what I'm looking more is that continuity and that flow. And um, Susan also talked about the soil types. In Milwaukee, most of us are dealing with clay. Um, as you get further away from Lake Michigan, you start to get more sandy soils. So it really does depend where you're located um, in Wisconsin because we do have such a high um, diversity of soils due to our glacial past. So, but most of us in, in Milwaukee proper are gonna be dealing with some sort of clay soil. And it gets a bad rep, but clay is so high in nutrients because it's electrically charged that there's so much potential that's there. We just abuse the landscape and the soils. And so we need to start you know, incorporating plants that were historically present within the state and we could start healing that soil and bringing more organic matter into it and allowing it to release some of those nutrients. So when people say I have clay soil and I can't get anything to grow here, it's like, well, how are you planting things? And um, we'll talk about green mulch a little bit later, later. And I think that is one really important way to prevent um, the dry cracking of clay soils that we're so used to. You know, we're getting right now, everything's getting flooded and saturated and we all have standing water in our yards, but then summer comes and we get these dry cracks. And, you know, if we're planting properly, then we can, you know, avoid those drastic changes. And I also plant for resilience. Um, and this is basically just doing high diversity. And what this causes is it prevents things like the, the top right picture where we have deer just completely defoliating a, a hedge. Um, if we plant with higher diversity, the deer have to work harder to get to those arborvitae. And so if we have Joe pie weed or nine bark, um, more diversity in our, in our hedge line, then you know we're providing a more resilient landscape where we're not gonna have pests. And these could be pests that are you know, insects or um, fungal diseases, things like that, but it also can be larger animals such as deer. Um, so we wanna plant species in between each other and kind of give a more um, natural approach is the way that I look at it. You know, we don't have, you know, 
10 plants in a row necessarily. We have like maybe five here and five further down. Um, so we kind of spread them out and blend them in together. And we, we make the pest work for their meal. And we're not giving them a whole plate of their favorite plant. We're giving them one and then they have to expel some energy to get to the next one. And this also provides a place for beneficial insects to grow and to keep those pests in check. And so then we don't have these hard, large um, over um, populations coming up and defoliating our species because we have that beneficial insect on the plant right next to it and it can come over and take care of them. So that's one reason to plant species in amongst each other. And you can still do the focal plants um, or the mass planting where you have the three and five species or same plant together. But if you have other species mixed in, um, then you kind of give that benefit back. And uh, the keystone species, these are kind of, this is my go-to list um, when I start doing designs. These are the categories that I wanna check off when I'm putting in plants. So I wanna, you know, shrubs are very overlooked in our landscape. We wanna, you know, have those open sight lines, but we also want privacy. So what do we do? We put up a fence. But what if we used some of our thicket forming um, shrubs instead of a, of a wood fence or a metal fence? And so I want to put shrubs in there and that also provides habitat for birds and um, a food source um, for pollinators during while they're during the flowering time, but then also birds during the migration in the fall. Having large campi trees, this is probably a check mark that you can already mark off because you probably already have some sort of shade tree. Hopefully it's a native, um, but if it's not, you can plant one in there and um, as that matures, you know, it can maybe outcompete and take over the place. And as the other one that's already there fails, or if you want to take it down later um, as your landscape matures, you can do that too. I also try to include host species such as milkweeds. Um, I'm sure most of you who are on this call are familiar with monarchs and milkweeds, but there's so many other butterflies and insects in general that have specific host plants that they need. So I try to always get a couple of those in there so that I know I'm providing plants for those specific insects. But it's not only gonna benefit those insects, it's also gonna benefit other insects that are using it during the flowering time or even the seeds. Um, also having pollinator magnets. So like the blazing star, the Liatris species, some of those plants, that the, the pollinators, they all just flock to them and it just gives them that huge burst of energy and keeps them going. So there's some of those that I try to always include. Um, and grasses and sedges are overlooked a lot in landscape designs. And I think these are so pivotal because they help, in my opinion, keep the native landscape from looking super messy. So these give structure to the landscape. They help hold up those taller species so they don't all flop over. Um, and, and look like they're failing. You know, we have more of a structure to the whole landscape. Um, and they also, when you do a plant a bunch of them, you know, in a row, that can give a really nice look, um, a really nice ground cover um, if you wanted to do that too. And then the spring ephemerals and the asters and goldenrods, this is just an example of keeping things blooming all year long. Um, so we wanna have something that's blooming right away, end of April, early May, so that those bees that are emerging, those bumblebee queens that are looking for a new site to nest, we wanna give them something to, um, a so food source that they can have right away when they're waking up. And then on the flip side, we wanna have something that's blooming late into the fall, um, October, sometimes into November. Some of our aster species and goldenrods are still blooming for those straggling monarchs that are heading south. So we wanna have something that's blooming all year long. And by doing those different time frames, we're having food being produced at different times because each species has its own cycle that it'll go through from bloom to, to food production or to seed production. And so you have something in the landscape that's always in flower and something that's always in um, food production for um, animals to eat on. And then it also gives you the structure for the whole winter and some plants will stay, if you keep them standing through the winter, it gives you winter interest as well. And then looking at designing with phasing, um, again, to kind of reiterate some of the points that Susan already made, um, having a whole design plan is really nice and easy, especially for people who maybe don't have um, the landscape design experience or knowledge. If 
I give a client a landscape plan that's for their whole property, they can then piece it together as they're able to, but it gives them something to look forward to and kind of a template to follow. Um, I'm also, you know, not very strict on people sticking with my plans, but if um, it gives them a, plan, stand, a starting point and then they can manipulate it as they go, as they learn things, um, you know, there's no failures in landscaping. There's only learning experiences and learning opportunities. So things are going to evolve as they as they mature and, and grow. Um, so you're always able, it's, it's kind of an easy, an easy way to manipulate and add things in. And um, if one species for some reason in your woodland area isn't working, then just go back to your list and find another species that would um, kind of fill that niche. Um, it also, by phasing things in, kind of gives your neighbors some time to warm up to what you're doing um, and, and get them on board. Because I know from my own personal experience, my neighbors were just like, so what's going on in your front yard? You've completely ripped out um, your landscape bed. And now I have them coming over all the time asking, oh, what are you working on now? What plants are you putting in? So it gets them interested because they see you out there working on it and being in, invested in your landscape versus just a passerby. And you'll want to start with your larger specimen plantings. So if you don't have a tree on your property, I would start by putting a tree in and some shrubs um, because those species take the longest to reach maturity. So you want to get them in the ground first. Um, and then you can fill in with perennials and ground covers in between them as you know the budget allows. But always, you know, starting in the front is always nice because it does give that curb appeal. Um, but then working on your problem areas, you know, if that wet corner is really bothering you and you can't mow it because it's always saturated, then get some wetland plants in there and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, get some privacy up with some hedge species, things like that. You can help drive what areas you focus on. And then I'm just going to go through a couple examples of different jobs that I have just to kind of um, reiterate some of the points that I've already made. Um, but when you're looking at your microclimates, don't forget to look beyond your property. Um, so this property has um, no trees in their yard um, before we installed them. This was after a uh, picture after installation, but before it had no trees. So you would think full sun, you know, let's put a bunch of prairie plants in. But there is a Norway maple that's a street tree right next to the property. And so that's casting shade on half of the, their lot. So we needed to put some wet, uh, woodland plants in. So you want to look beyond whether that's a building, um, the slope, um, if your neighbor's property is draining onto yours. Um, this is all things that, you know, as you're living on the property and you walk it, you know, multiple times during the year, during the seasons, you start to pick up on some of these cues and you start thinking about things a little bit differently. So don't focus on just within your property lines. You'll also kind of want to look around. And then, you know, gray water is a great source to keep um, water on your property. And it's easy to do. You know, most of us in Southeast Wisconsin, we have sub pumps um, because of the clay soils and we're just, we do get a lot of precipitation. And so instead of just letting this discharge out into drain tiles or pumping it out to the street and to the sewer system, let's put in a pond. Um, let's you know, create something that is used by someone instead of just sending the water right to the treatment plant. Um, and you can use downspouts as well for this or even just sheet draining off of your driveways and sidewalks. So if we can hold the water on our property, whether it's in a pond or a rain garden, if you don't wanna have water on your property, um, standing water. You can just put in a rain garden and these plants will be able to handle being saturated during periods of the time. Um, this one, you know, we have a little pond and it was a plastic lined pond, but we put some rocks around it. We let the sub pump go into it. And now we have dragonflies that will breed in this. And this is, you know, in Milwaukee, in the city, um, that we have dragonflies and leopard frogs that are using this water um, as a life source for them and birds will also go and um, drink in it and it's a, a way to make it more natural versus having a bird bath and it's, it's your taste you can do either one um, but why having water on your site is essential to providing that habitat that wildlife needs and it also provides a great way for you to get interact with nature and to watch it and I mean you could sit in this window and watch what's going on on the pond um, and you know be involved in your landscape 
I uh, mentioned designing with the slope. So this is another easy way to include different plant species, you know, at the top of the slope, the water is going to drain away from there faster. So you can put in your prairie plants or your drier species. And then at the bottom, you have your wetland plants. So again, that transition zone where we can get more species planted into a small area just by how the landscape is formed. Um, this one was a really bad drainage situation where it was constantly flooded. Uh, so we put a bunch of wetland plants into their drainage ditch. And the second year it took off and their, their main goal was to provide habitat for frogs um, that wasn't turf grass. And so we put in these native plants and they had green frogs that were in there and it, in the shade of the plants, you know, kept it nice and moist for them and an ideal landscape for them to enjoy and the kids of this client, you know, they go out there and watch the frogs. So the green mulch, I mentioned this earlier, this is how we can deal with our clay soils and what it does, or I guess what it is, is it's using a plant that's a ground cover and using it to cover the ground and to fill in between your other plantings. Um, it does give it a more natural look. So if you don't wanna have, if you would like having the spacing between your different species, this may not be a, an ideal solution for you, um, but it's a, an alternative to just putting down hardwood mulch every year. So we put in a living mulch. And what this does is it keeps the soil moist because the leaves of the ground cover the green mulch, um, and in this example, it's wild strawberry, those leaves protect the soil from getting pummeled by the sun's um, rays throughout the day. And so it keeps the soil most, we don't, we don't get that cracking that I showed earlier on that one picture. Um, we don't get the really hard, compact clay that seems impenetrable to anything. Um, and the reason we did it in this design was because it was a west facing planting bed. It's next to the white um, siding. So it's getting a lot of reflected light in addition to the direct sunlight. It's surrounded by hardscaping. So this is a really kind of inhospitable environment. So besides doing the dry planting, the dry prairie species for the planting, we also incorporated the green mulch and you know, it reduces the weeds. It keeps everything nice and hydrated um, because it doesn't dry out as easily. And so they have a beautiful landscaping bed um, with flowers throughout the whole season. And then finally, we, uh, we're getting out of the winter season. So this picture is a little misplaced in that sense, but you know, thinking about the view from inside the house, you know, we have been talking a lot about, you know, going outside and, and enjoying the space, but we do spend a lot of time in our homes. So um, looking out at the landscape, what do we want to look at? Um, this one, we have a couple trees that are in view. We have prairie plants that are there. And, you know, then we can enjoy nature from inside, you know, during the winter when not much is going on, the birds are just rummaging through all of these species to get the seeds from the, the bergamot and the comb flowers. Um, and we just have all that excitement, all that joy that we can watch um, from our nice inside our cozy homes. And it's also a nice backdrop to, you know, watch during the blooming season and to see all the visitors that are using our landscape um, when we're inside versus if we're not outside. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, Danielle. And if you wanna stop sharing your screen and Susan, if you wanna join us as well, it's time for questions. So we had a couple of questions from the audience. We thought you guys both did a fantastic job. There's a lot of uh, people that were really inspired and uh, also very excited to share some questions with you. So I wanted to first off say, Catherine, Bob, Carla, Judy, John, Sienna, and Tarly, Tari all asked what software tools you used. We did mention that Susan uses Structure Studios, but they also wanted to know, Danielle, from you, um, what you use as well. Yeah, so for most of my designs, I use um, AutoCAD. So I just do a 2D program um, to lay out my spatial um, qualities of the landscape. I do all the measurements and everything on there. And then um, when I present it to people, I do the pictures just like Susan was saying, so they can see what the plants are gonna look like. Um, I've been with different industries where people don't show the clients their plants and I just 
I don't understand how you can agree to anything if you don't know what the plants look like. But yeah, definitely having something that has, you know, the spatial mapping where you can measure everything out is nice. Perfect. Anything else that you use, Susan, that you'd like to recommend? Um, I, I typically use, uh, I, I just really love Structure Studios because it does a 3D effect right now. I've also used Dynascape and it's a great program. So it just depends on what a designer wants to use. I mean, whatever works for them. Fantastic. A uh, question came from Jessica Lynn. She's interested in becoming a landscape designer as a second career. She wants to know where can she find the right training for native plant design and sustainable practices and how both of you uh, use that training in your work. Danielle, do you wanna go first or do you want me to go? Sure, sure, I can take it. Um, yeah, so I will say I am not a formal landscape designer. I'm more of an ecologist. So I came at it from that point. Um, and I think you can kind of see that between Susan's approach and my approach, um, just because they are a little different. Um, so I think of things more, and I've learned a lot of my stuff by going to um, different programs that nature centers put on um, and different, like the wild, lot of the programs that the wild ones put on and just learning more about the plants was the approach that I took and working in the ecosystems and the environment. And then I'm now bringing them into the residential landscape design. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I would say just try to learn as much as you can. I mean, Doug Tell Me is a huge resource. Um, to me, plants are a little bit more important than some of the de design features, but um, again, it's up to you and the clients that you're working with um, and how you want to approach it. But I, magazines, webinars, I think those are all really great ways to, to, um, to start. Thank you. Uh, Susan, did you want to add anything about your approach and, and how you found the right training for native plant design? Yeah, so um, I think that the easiest way, I mean, seriously, Wild Ones is such a great a great tool to learn about native plants and the people who are so passionate about it are there, which is awesome. There are also um, places that have native plant societies. Uh, Texas has an amazing one and they are seriously focused on garden design here. So they actually have a whole program for garden designing with native plants. But when I was researching and trying to learn more, Wild Ones was my go-to place. And of course, Denise Gearing was like, the person that I went to because she knew so much about plants. But um, I also really sought out different things and each area usually has something going on. Like when I lived in the DC area, I joined the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals and they had a program. So really you just need to look and see what's available in your area and find some, um, it, it's really key to know some good botanists who really love their plants so that you as a designer can be more educated. And it's great to hear both of you talking about a plant-centric design. And one of the things that came up was the green mulch concept. So um, I know that, um, Danielle, you shared some plants that you use. And if they um, are interested, I know that we also had a portion of this, uh, this uh, current journal, Wild Ones Journal, that ISO Plants talked about using the native sedum as a green mulch. But can you jump just a little bit deeper into on um, the concept of green mulches and why you selected those plants? Yeah, so the plants that I select for green mulch are typically short in stature. So they're only gonna get to be about six inches tall and usually they're spreading to some sort of extent. And that can be kind of scary for some people because when you think spreading, you're like, ah, they're gonna take over everything. But because they're short in stature, because they're native plants that are with other native plants and they should hopefully be, you know, somewhat compatible with the ecosystem and the, the microclimate that you're putting them in, they're not going to completely take over. They're going to, the wild strawberry is a really great example because it sends these little runners and they just like somehow just find their way in between the other species. So they just co-evolve together. Um, and I mean, if you go out on a hike, you know, you're going to see all these plants, they, they exist together and you can kind of start to pick out which ones you might want to to use. Um, but yeah, short in stature is kind of the, the biggest thing that I look for with the green mulches, um, especially in an urban um, rural landscape design where things are a little bit smaller to begin with. You know, we don't want to get anything too crazy spreading in there. Great. Thank you. Uh, 
as both of you are probably uh, bitten by the same contagious bug that you want to have every single plant out there as Amy Wilhelm, who sent in a question. And she said, I'm curious if you have any tips for making your garden feel cohesive when you find yourself to be a bit of a plant collector and have a hard time. Um, personally, I have that problem. And so I just try to do, um, as I, I've tried to make cozy, now I'm in a new house. And so it's, it's pretty fun. But what I do is I, I make a plan and then I'll always try to repeat. So what usually happens is I buy a plant and I don't want to buy 15 of them. So I'll buy it and then I'll propagate it. And then I'll spread that out into different areas just so I can pull that plant across into another place in my design in my yard. So that's one of the things that I do that helps just propagating what I already have and, you know, trying to blend it into different areas. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I do the same thing. Um, I mean, it's why go out and buy all these plants when you can start propagating them yourself. Um, wild columbine is one that comes to my mind. Every fall, I go out and collect the seeds and shake them in another area. Um, and that plant is also great. You know, I talked about the different um, plant communities that I use when I'm designing, there's no, there's not a hard line again between those different communities. So some plants like, again, well, columbine, you know, that's a shade plant, but it also is a rock garden plant that will tolerate full sun and very little moisture. So there's, you know, some plants that, that may be your connector, the ones that aren't very specific to where they, they thrive that you can then put into different areas um, but yeah, again, that's, you know, starting with the phasing, if you start with one bed and you liked some of those plants, just take one or two of those and incorporate those into the other areas that you're going to expand your beds in. All great tips and great ways to expand and, and build up. And one of the, you know, tasks of the designers was making sure that their designs were able to be presented in a phased approach. So um, great tips there. Uh, questions came in from several people about planting in partially wet areas. So Darcy, Janet, um, and many others were asking about what wetland plants you would look for, um, but also do you avoid planting in septic areas or areas of standing water? Um, I don't deter from planting in either of those areas. Again, it's the right plant in the right place. Um, you definitely, if you have standing water, you may wanna look at why you have standing water and some ways you can alleviate that is by putting in a buffer. Um, so if you have standing water and say it's coming from your downspout, maybe putting a couple beds in so that you have more native plants that the water is traveling through. So it's not just ponding in that one spot and you start infiltrating it um, closer um, or I guess it kind of depends where it is, but you know, you have more square footage that the water can go in before it gets to that spot if it's ponding um, or diverting it away. Um, but again, it's, yeah, it's the right plant, right place. There's so many great wetland plants that you can choose from um, that I would definitely, you know, just select some of those if you have standing water. I agree. And um, it's our excuse to use cardinal flower all the time and iris, but it just depends on where you live because you know, down here in Texas, I can't use the same plants that I would use if, when I was in Ohio or when I was out in the DC area. So you need to um, get a hold of some people that love to do rain gardens in your area and find out what they use in their rain gardens and start putting those in your space. Definitely. Great ideas and concepts. And I wanted to also ask both of you, what got you interested in the native plant movement and wild ones? Um, I can go first. Um, so the one thing that really drove me to get into the native plant, um, besides just loving nature and being outside, was when I worked in the green industry, I was kind of the loner. Um, nobody really understood where I was coming from. Um, I got stuck with all the native landscapes or the restoration jobs because so many people that I worked with just didn't understand what the goal was of them. Um, and so I just, you know, after being in that environment, I, I needed something else. Um, and so I just found my own, my own path. I started connecting with people that were in the conservation field and um, just kind of, you know, 
took my, my goals a different direction. Instead of focusing on being in the green industry, I decided to actually be in the green industry and not <laughs> um, what we typically think of as the green industry. And for you, Susan, what got you interested in native plants and wild ones? Well, so um, actually volunteering, when I was going, when I went back to become a master gardener, I was at Toledo Botanical Gardens and of course met Matt and met Denise. And Denise was the gateway drug to native plants. <laughs> so um, and the more I learned, the more excited I became, the more, you know, na nature walks we went on, the more things I, I, I just, it was eye opening to me, just the potential. Um, the great thing was my dad got hooked at the same time. And so I was able to enjoy him, you know, propagating stuff. And so that's where I started. And, and for me, it's great. It's really hard sometimes when you work for somebody else as a designer to be able to use all native plants. So then, you know, it, it if you start working for somebody else and you, you just sneak those native plants in there and then, you know, then your clients are like, oh, I want more. So that's how I started. Mm -hmm. Well, there's over 75 questions that remain uh, mm -hmm. and we wanted to be conscious of everyone's time tonight. A couple ideas for those of you that still have questions, both uh, of our designers provided great resources and great concepts. Danielle mentioned looking back at the eco region or the different types of plant communities that thrive in different ecosystems. So for those of you that were looking for areas that are wet at times and dry at others, you might look towards the wet meadows in your region. Susan shared about the organization of space, about how to look at your garden in different ways and three dimensionality and looking at the function and movement throughout the space. We also encourage all of you to review this document and also to rewatch tonight's presentation share it with your friends, your family, prospective members, and members of your Wild Ones chapters. You can also go online and connect with other Wild One members through Facebook, as well as attend other Wild Ones chapter meetings for more local advice. The resources that you saw today were made available to you and, your mem and our members through the generosity of the Stanley Smith Horticultural Trust. We searched the nation to find top designers that have been designing native landscapes, and we're looking for all of you to carry on that vision. We encourage you to use the templates that are provided, or if you're in an area where a template might not yet be provided, to work with your own Wild Ones chapter to develop one that would work for you and your fellow peers. We'd love to see pictures of your planted gardens showing us how these designs come to life over time. Please share them on Facebook and Instagram with us as well as promoting the native plants through sharing pictures and your physical landscape with others. This is only the beginning and we're looking forward to seeing your progress and also what templates we'll have in the future to come. We also wanna encourage all of you to uh, start a budding new garden with Seeds for Education and continuing on with this series and join us as we go on to meet the designers Carmen Simonet of Minneapolis and Susie Van de Riet of St. Louis. I apologize if I am pronoun pronounce your names incorrectly, uh, but they are gonna be joining us on Wednesday, April 7th from six to 7 p.m. Central. That's an online event. We're looking forward to having all of you join us for that program and definitely make sure to view the Native Garden Designs at nativegardendesigns.wildones.org. And for those of you that are not members yet, we'd love to have you join us and become a Wild Ones member. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, where this will be recorded and presented, as well as Twitter. We're very happy to have started this uh, program tonight with an introduction of Danielle and Susan. And we wanna thank both of you as we sign off for the evening. Thank you for sharing your talents and your expertise with all of us. Thanks for having us. Yep, thank you.